Hi, my name is Roger. In the last video, I told you 10 things that any ventilator system has to have considered before a clinician can use it to treat patients safely to get a positive outcome. In this video, I'm gonna talk about a system architecture that achieves those 10 things, that has considered those 10 things. I'm also gonna go through why each one of these elements is important. And then at the end of the video, I'm gonna give some examples of how you might implement each one of these elements to create your own system. And there'll be a few links in the description to some areas where people have done those things uh, or where I've demonstrated some of those things. So let's just start with a rundown of the whole architecture of the system. First off, we have a pressure source here. There's also some filtration and possibly an oxygen feed. Next, we have a humidifier. Next, we have input pressure regulation. Here we have pressure monitoring, pressure relief. We have a bypass here. So this is where you could connect another tube. We have the valves and timing. Here we have a long tubing run. Here we have the anti-backflow region. We have another bypass, a patient connection. Up here we have output pressure regulation, an output air filter, and then the exhaust. So let's go through these in a bit more detail. The pressure source, this could be any pressure source. It could be a compressed air cylinder. This could be an oxygen cylinder. It could be an oxygen concentration device. Uh, you could have an air pump. You could have a header tank of water with a column of air underneath it. It could be a set of bellows. It could be a manual bag. But what's important here is that you have enough pressure, more pressure than you need. You have some filtration and possibly the potential to introduce oxygen. The reason you need filtration is because when you intubate somebody, you're bypassing a lot of their normal protection mechanisms. So the nose and the mouth are designed to catch, uh, to catch particles and to catch bacteria. And if you're bypassing those, you need some method of protecting the lungs, especially of a vulnerable patient, you need to protect their lungs even more. An oxygen feed, the whole purpose of this is that the patient's lung function is impaired. And so by providing an increased amount of oxygen, you're able to provide them with more oxygen into their blood, which means that they will be able to breathe better. Next thing on the list, the humidifier. As I mentioned in the last video, this is because you're bypassing the nose and the throat and the mouth. And so a lot of the moisture that would normally be introduced isn't introduced. If you don't humidify the air, if the air is too dry going into their body, then you could dehydrate their lungs. It's also preferable to warm up the air because that increases the amount of moisture that it can hold. So warm, wet air is ideal. A couple of ways you could do the humidifying. You could have a spray going into the airflow, a spray of water going into the airflow. You could have the airflow being bubbled through water. Whatever your implementation, you need to be concerned about bacterial growth in this region because warm, wet air is a great way to grow bacteria. And as I mentioned, you're bypassing a lot of the body's defenses. So you don't want to be pushing that warm, wet bacterial air directly into a vulnerable patient's lungs. Next on the list is input pressure regulation. This is important not only to be able to set it, but to be able to change it over time. This is because the needs of a patient might change over time. You might start with a high pressure when you want to have a large volume of air going into their lungs, but then at a later date, if their lung function begins to, begins to be impaired, you might want to have a lower pressure and a faster breathing rate. So shorter, shallower breaths rather than long, deep breaths. Pressure monitoring, this is very important for the clinician to make sure that the right amount of air, the right pressure of air is being delivered to the patient. Not just being able to set it, but being able to check that what you set is actually what's being delivered. Next thing is pressure relief. This could be a burst disc, this could be a water bottle. This is to make sure that you don't overpressure the patient's lungs. If something goes wrong with any of this system upstream, you don't end up applying too much pressure and damaging the patient's lungs. 
this bypass system. The reason that the bypass system is in place on this diagram is that we're expecting that this won't have gone through the same kind of rigorous testing and regulatory controls of a medical ventilator system. If you're building something from parts that you have available, there's a chance that something will go wrong. And so you want to have the ability to disconnect that system if something does start to go wrong. If you see that your pressure relief has gone, then you know that there's overpressure somewhere in the system, you might need to fix it. This bypass allows you to reconnect an entirely new section of this system without disconnecting the patient. Remember that their lung function is impaired, so any time that the system isn't working is time that they're not breathing. By having a bypass, you can quickly connect something new and get them breathing again as quickly as possible. There are three bypass lines on this diagram. There's one here, which is for this part of the system. There's one here, which is for this part of the system. And there's one here, which is for the complete system. If something goes wrong, you can connect a manual ventilation bag here and you can keep the patient going for a few minutes while you either find out what's wrong and fix this system or you connect an entirely new system. Next thing down the list, the valves and the timing. Here there are two valves. One is always open when the other is closed and they will swap over depending on whether you're breathing in or breathing out. The reason why you have to have these active valves here is because if you didn't have these valves and you tried to apply a positive pressure, it would go all the way through the system, bypassing the patient's lung entirely. And that's because this pressure regulation needs to be here. I'll come back to that in a second. Here we have this extended tubing run. This tubing run allows us to have all of this equipment a long way from the patient relatively long way from the patient, perhaps a few feet, and only this section close to their face. The anti-backflow section prevents air from flowing back up those tubes and just cycling air in and out of the tubes rather than providing fresh air to the lungs so that the patient can absorb that, that oxygen and expel the CO2. Here we have the patient connection. The assumption here is that it is intubation. And the reason that is important is because of this. So right here, this output pressure regulation is to maintain PEEP, the positive end expiratory pressure. So this is holding back a pressure inside the lung, preventing this lung from deflating and the alveoli from collapsing. If we weren't intubating, we would have to continue to apply a positive pressure rather than just holding back a pressure. That's called EPAP end positive airway pressure. So that, that would be a different system. This system is only for intubation. Then we have an air filter. This is for reducing the viral load in the room where this is operating. So you're not expiring viral particles into the room, which could, uh, which could get clinicians ill, or it could increase the viral load on patients in the surrounding area. And then we just have an exhaust. So let's go down the list of 10 things and see how many of those we've covered. First, timing. Okay, yeah, we've got these valves here. They do the timing of the breath. If you change the rate at which they switch and how long each one is open, then you can change the breathing rate and you can change the ratio of inspiratory to expiratory phases, breathing in to breathing out. If your pressure source is cyclic if your pressure source is like bellows that pressure source has to be linked to these valves second thing positive pressure yep we've got input pressure regulation here and we've got pressure monitoring we also have this pressure relief and that's all being delivered by uh, the pressures being maintained by this pressure source third thing peep regulation Yep, that is exactly what this is doing. This is the PEEP pressure regulator. Fourth thing, don't interfere with breathing. I mentioned in the last video, there are three ways that you can do this. You can apply drugs, either paralytics or sedatives to suppress lung function. You can detect breathing rate, or you can have some other means. 
This system has no sensing on it, which feeds back from the patient to the system. Therefore, this has to be used in conjunction with appropriate drugs so that the lung function is suppressed. Number five, prevent overinflation. Again, these three are pivotal. So the clinician sets the right pressure, the clinician can monitor the pressure, and there's a pressure relief which is gonna prevent catastrophic damage if something goes wrong. Number six, clean air in and an oxygen feed. And we have here a bit of filtration and we have the potential for an oxygen feed. There's no detail here, but that's what this module needs to cover. Number seven, humid air and temperature. This diagram only covers humidity. It doesn't cover temperature. So if the temperature is low, then this system is gonna struggle and the patient is gonna struggle. Number eight, operation for 10 days. This isn't covered anywhere explicitly on this diagram, but this is something that needs to be considered in all the different aspects of this system when they're being implemented. Number nine, check it's working. That's the next phase of this development. Once you have a system, you need to put it through a process that's gonna check that it's working. And number 10, failure modes. What happens if something goes wrong? And how do you make sure that you've considered that? I've described a few of those already. On the system level, I have these bypass connections. So if anything goes wrong, those bypass connections can be used. On an individual component level, you need to know what method you're using for each one of these blocks to be able to do an analysis of how it might fail and how you should replace those components, change that design in order to make it safer if it does fail. Okay, so I've described this system, the functions of the elements and how it maps onto here. So now I'm gonna give a few examples that I've found of how you can implement each one of these functions. So this humidifier, pressure regulation, pressure monitoring, pressure relief, and output pressure regulation, all five of these things can be done with water bottles and tubes. I showed a video uh, about a week ago of how you might be able to do that if all you have is a water bottle, uh, actually you need lots of water bottles, but if all you have is water bottles and tubing, all of those can be done. There are of course other methods of doing those, but I'll have a link to the water bottle method below. When we look at this uh, valve and timing area, a friend of mine has created a system where it uses a rotary shaft, some cams and some tubing again, which allows you to switch up not only the timing of the breath rate, but also the ratio of breathing in to breathing out. It's a very simple setup, it's quite robust, it should last for a long time and it's easy to find the components. I'll have a link below to that video. Anti-backflow region, this is all about check valves. There are lots of check valves out there which you can make using materials that are readily available. Um, I'm going to build a couple of those and demonstrate how they work uh, in a future video. The pressure source is an area that's been covered by a lot of people online already. A lot of the time people stop at this point once they've got the pressure source. So a few examples include BVMs that are being squeezed by some cyclic motion uh, or just applying pressure from a compressed air canister um, or an oxygen concentrator uh, with some positive pressure behind it. The filtration is something that would, uh, could come from an adapted N95 mask. Bear in mind that any filtration that you put in line is going to increase the pressure behind it. If you have an air filter on the outflow up here and it has a significant back pressure, if it's got a small area or if it's a very dense filter, you might want to swap these two elements. If this is right before the outflow, then you're measuring the real output pressure that the lung is seeing. Hopefully this gives you an idea of how all the different elements of a ventilator system tie together and how 
if you don't have the components to build one of these elements in a way that you've seen demonstrated, how you can use your own materials, your own capabilities to build a functional element that does the same job and maintains the same connections between the other elements of the system. Please remember, whatever you end up creating, check that it's working, check that it does whatever you've designed it to do. And secondly, any system like this is gonna to have to be used by a clinician. So make sure you speak to a clinician to check that what you have designed the system to do and how it functions works for that clinician's needs. If you have any questions about anything that's in this presentation, or if you would like to know more about some of the implementations that we have created, then please drop a comment in the, in the box below. As I said, I've got a few links that will go into that, uh, that description as well for different ways that we have implemented some of, these, um, some of these functions so that you can try those for yourselves.